Okay, antimicrobial actions and resistance. So this is one of the more, like I said, this is one of the more difficult lectures. I'll try to make it as painless as possible and make it as understandable as poss possible. But that handout that I just showed you is, is a pretty good breakdown of this lecture. Okay, there's a lot of theory and mechanism of action in this lecture that I may or may not ask you about, but it'll help you understand why the antibiotics are broken down the way they are in that handout. Okay, so antibiotic classes, uh, cell wall synthesis inhibitors, those are the beta lactams I touched about. I touched on how uh, the beta lactam ring and beta lactamase works in the previous lecture. Cell membrane function inhibitors, um, grouped into either lipopeptides or polymyxins. So cell wall, in, cell wall synthesis inhibitors are your beta lactams or your glycopeptides. The beta lactams are your cephalosporins, okay? Uh, the protein synthesis inhibitors, it's a pretty large group. The main ones are the aminoglycosides, the MLS group, which is, includes macrolide, lincosamide, and streptogramin. Then you have the ketolides, oxazolid, oxaz oxazolidinones, chlorophenicol, tetracycline, and glycoglycines. Inhibitors of RNA and DNA synthesis include the fluoroquinolones, metronitrazole, and rifampin. And then you have inhibitors of other metabolic processes, which includes the sulfonamides, trimethoprim, and nitroforantoin. So uh, cell wall synthesis inhibitors. Uh, the two uh, groups are beta-lactam and glycopeptides. And the beta-lactam, like I said, are your cephalosporins binds to PBPs, which are penicillin-binding proteins, which stop cell wall synthesis, penicillin-binding protein, okay? So these antibiotics will stop cell wall synthesis, and that's how it kills the organism. The glycopeptides will bind to precursors of cell wall synthesis. So precursors before in the development of the cell wall, that's how the glycopeptides work. And also to, so the beta-lactam also stops cell wall synthesis. Beta-lactam antimicrobial agents include the penicillins, the cephalosporins, carbapenems, and monobactams. Those are your beta-lactam antibiotics. Then you got your glycopeptide and your polypeptide. Beta-lactam action is specific to bacteria and it prevents the, the synthesis of the peptidoglycan. And like I said, uh, in the previous lecture, it binds to the enzymes of the protein binding protein involved in the synthesis. And when that happens, it, the cell undergoes lysis. You got no, you got no structure in the cell wall, the, cell, the, the organism will just lyse. And this antibiotic affects both gram positives and gram negatives. And it only affects actively growing cells, okay? The penicillins are derived from the fungus, penicillin notatum, um, by, discovered by Alexander Fleming a long time ago, 1928. And uh, once they found its effectiveness in, in curing infections, then it was mass produced in 1940. There are more than 50 clinically related compounds of penicillin, uh, starting with the natural penicillin. So you have PEN-G, PEN-V, penicillin benzathine, penicillin procaine, a whole bunch of different types of penicillins. But you got your narrow spectrum and those susceptible to penicillinase. Penicillinase, remember, if you have an organism has penicillinase, it's trying to kill that antibiotic, right? Penicillinase, it's kind of like beta-lactamase, but uh, penicillinase is an uh, enzyme specific to penicillin. So the enzyme, the bacteria are trying, they're trying to fight back. Then you have your semi-synthetic penicillins, extended spectrum penicillin, which is your amino penicillins, which are ampicillin and amoxicillin, your carboxy penicillins, which is carbenicillin and tricarcillin, and ure ureido penicillins, which is mesocillin and azocillin. You have to, you'll have to know the, um, these uh, antibiotics on the right side, but you're not, you won't need to know amino, carboxy, and ureido penicillins. So I don't think so. 
excuse me for one second. Just, I just want to check. Okay, no, you, you won't have to. Okay. Penicillin H resistant penicillins, oxacillin, napcillin, and methicillin. You can you can see my PowerPoint again, right? We're back to the PowerPoint. Yes. Yes. Okay. And then the semi-synthetic penicillins, and the semi-synthetic penicillins are a combination of two uh, antibiotics: penicillin plus a beta lactamase inhibitor, and you have three of them. Clavulanate, sobactam, and tazobactam. So clavulanate is uh, attached to amoxicillin, and that's what's called, uh, the commercial name of that pair is augmentin. And then you have sobactam uh, attached to ampicillin, and uh, that combination is called unison. And then you got tazobactam uh, attached with piperacillin, and that's zosin. Okay, so make sure you know the pairs and you need to know the commercial names of Augmentin, Unison, and Zosin. Those will be, this, this uh, slide will definitely be on, a, on the test, either quiz or quiz or exam. Okay, more than 50 penicillins recognized, as I mentioned earlier, penicillinase, cephalosporinase, um, metallobeta-lactamase, and again, uh, the mechanism of action uh, on the, these uh, the beta lactamase is to attack is to attack the beta lactam ring, and you can see where it actually attacked attacks where the ring is broken up. So another way to other than the beta lactamase, another form of resistance is altered is to alter the antimicrobial target. Uh, so if an antibiotic is targeting a specific part of the, the bacteria, then it's going to alter that target of the antibiotic. So there's a mutational change in order to do that. Or another uh, defense mechanism is to decrease the uptake of the an antimicrobial. So at the port of entry where the antibiotic will enter the bacteria, it'll decrease the uptake of that antibiotic. And that's through the porin uh, you know, changes in the porin channel, or there's an efflux pump. So where the place where the antibiotic will enter the bacteria, it'll actually pump it out, okay? So these are three mechanisms of action that the bacteria will take against the antibiotic. These, these are forms of active uh, acquired uh, resistance. So here's the cell wall of uh, gram-positive organism and the gram-negative. These two oval things are the antibiotics and they're attacking the cell membrane here and the membrane, uh, the cell membrane here. And these are the porins and uh, I don't see where the efflux pumps are, but this is um, the, um, the cell wall of the antibiotic. So this is where the antibiotic would, would enter. Either it would change the target or it would decrease the uptake or it would efflux it out. Okay, once it enters, it'll just spit it out basically. Cephalosporins um, was uh, developed by Eli Lilly in 1964, beta lactam compounds fused with six membered dihydrothiazine ring, improved activity, better pharmacokinetics and additional side effects. Okay, so cephalosporins were developed in the mid sixties. Um, you have ge different generations of cephalosporins, and that's why it's important that when a doctor prescribes for it to you uh, different antibiotics, you need to take them because if you don't take them, there's going to be one or two organisms that survive that antibiotic. And if you don't continue taking those, those antibiotics, if you don't keep, continue to take those antibiotics, they will survive and make more babies that are resistant, similar to the parents, and then now you have a new generation of resistant organisms. That's why you have a first generation and different generations. So the first generation uh, was, was good against gram-positive aerobic cocci, such as the beta strep group A, beta strep group B, and a viridan strep. 
Uh, it works on penicillin, susceptible anaerobes, and some gram-negative rods. And then there's a second generation, has three groups, the cephalosporins, the uh, cephamycins, uh, the carbocephins. So those are the three groups of the second generation, and it's good for gram-positive coverage, but for gram-negatives, it's actually better, and it's more resistant to beta-lactamase. So now you are um, seeing that there's resistance to beta-lactamase um, in the organism. So the organisms are fighting back. First, they have the uh, beta-lactamase to attack the beta-lactam ring, but now they're learning how to become resistant to the beta-lactam ring. Okay, and then you have the third generation of cephalosporins. Okay, like I said, if you don't continue to take your antibiotics, you're gonna get more and more uh, generations of these antibiotics. The third generation has two groups, the true and the oxycephems. Um, not so good against gram-positive organisms, but better against gram-negative uh, organisms uh, for hospital-acquired infections, which are the nosocomial infections. And it has better coag-negative staph penetration. And then you have the fourth generation, two groups again. So as you can see, these generations keep coming up. Um, and this is, this, is, this is a huge industry for the pharmaceuticals so because they 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 keep coming up with these antibiotics and medications and it's the bacteria that's keeping them rich because if the more the more um an organism becomes resistant to an antibiotic then it causes these companies to make more antibiotics and and it's it's just a, a huge industry and then you have your fifth sixth and seventh generation not yet established so I don't know exactly where we're at on the, on the generations, but this is the beta-lactam ring uh, with the beta-lactamase. Organism has beta-lactamase to attack that beta-lactam ring. Uh, cephalosporinases, extended spectrum beta-lactamase. So you have regular beta-lactamase. And then what happens is with these future, these newer generations, you have what's called extended spectrum beta-lactamase. Altered antimicrobial target, that's one, one of the things I mentioned about uh, the development of the antibiotic resistance is to change the antimicrobial target, or you can decrease the uptake of the antimicrobial and antimicrobials. But another way to get rid of it is to, the antibiotic is the, to efflux and just, just spit it out, okay? Oops. We already saw that slide. Okay, carbapenems, imipenem was developed in 1985 from Streptomyces catalia. Streptomyces is a fungus and it's good for Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is uh, actually good because Pseudomonas aeruginosa typically is a difficult bacteria to treat. Um, Enterococcus and Enterobacteriaceae are a little more easier to treat. Imipenem is not for MRSA and it's administered IV with Silostatin. Silostatin is, is an antibiotic that's usually, it's, it's a facilitator. So it's an antibiotic that is given with another antibiotic. So uh, imipenem is administered with silostatin. So it, it helps with the effectiveness of imipenem, which is the primary antibiotic. So silostatin basically is uh, a facilitator antibiotic. Miripenem, uh, developed in the 90s uh, in Japan. It has similar activity to imipenem, and it's a good penetration for CSF, peritoneal fluid, lungs, and bile. This one does not need uh, the assistance of silostatin, so you can give meropenem alone. Ertapenem, developed in 2001, can be either IV as an inpatient or intram intramuscular. No activity is not good against Pseudomonas, Acinetobacter, and Enterococcus. That's unfortunate because those organisms are usually, remember, uh, Actinobacter, Acinetobacter, I mean, uh, is an MVRO. Uh, Pseudomonas is difficult to treat. Enterococcus is a strip, but you got to be careful with Enterococcus because, um, because Enterococcus can develop into what's called um, BRE, which is vancomycin resistant Enterococcus. That's actually a panic value in microbiology. When you have a vancomycin resistant enterococcus, 
you know, a lot of people are going to want to know about it. Uh, Erythropenem is used mainly for Enterobacteriaceae. ESBL is, again, uh, a higher generation of beta lactamase. It stands for extended spectrum beta lactamase. It's the newer generation of beta lactamase, and it's good for anaerobes. Erythropenem works on gram positives. MSSA stands for methicillin sensitive Staph4S as opposed to methicillin resistant Staph4S. BSGB is beta strep group B, and GAS is group A strep. And erythropenem is, is useful because it has a longer half life, it stays around longer. Doropenem was de developed in 2007 in Japan, and this one's actually good for Pseudomonas. So, and it's used mainly for enter Enterobacteriaceae and extended spectrum beta lactamase producers. Panapenem beta, beta mypron is similar to imapenem uh, combination with silastin. Biapenem is good for anaerobes. PZ601 was developed in Japan. It's broad spectrum, has mul multiple routes, and can be given either aerosol or oral. The penems, okay, you heard a lot of penems. All are synthetic, sulfur instead of carbon, okay. Veropenem was developed in Japan, not USA FDA approved. Um, bacterial, good for bacterial sinusitis, pneumonia, bronchitis, uncomplicated skin infections. So good for respiratory and uncomplicated skin infection. Antibiotic resistance, okay. You got your carbapenemase uh, production, cephalosporinase production with foreign loss, uh, as 3 m was developed in 1986. It's another antibiotic, monocyclic beta-lactam, developed from the organism Chromobacterium biolaceum. Um, as 3 m is not good for gram positives, but it's good for gram negatives. A lot of these antibiotics seems like they are they're not that great for gram positives, but it's really good for gram negatives. Um, as 3 m is safe, safe for penicillin allergic patients. As you, as you know, that a lot of patient, people are allergic to penicillin. Tigamonum uh, is oral. It's not available in the US. It has good activity against gram positives and also for gram negatives. The glycopeptides, glycopeptides inhibits the formation of cell walls in gram positive bacteria. Um, not for gram negatives. So the glycopeptides, the main uh, antibiotic in the glycopeptides is vancomycin and tycoplanin. Okay. The important thing about vancomycin, okay, vancomycin is used for MRSA, um, good for sepsis, endocarditis. It's not effective against uh, as penicillin against methicillin sensitive Staph aureus. If given I IV route, uh, can be given IV intra intra um, intravenous or oral if targeting Clostridium difficile associated disease or enocolitis. The one uh, precaution about vancomycin, and you'll be asked this, is that it causes red man baby or redneck syndrome. Okay, you can actually uh, turn red if you take too much vancomycin. Okay, you get your red man syndrome or redneck syndrome. Antibiotic resistance can be either intrinsic or it can be acquired. So some gram positives have intrinsic resistance. Uh, vancomycin resistant enterococcus, I mentioned that. If you have a vancomycin resistant enterococcus, that's an infection control emergency. If on any other gram positive, especially staff. So the rule of thumb is that all gram positives all gram positives are sensitive to vancomycin. So I think I may have mentioned earlier in an earlier lecture that if there was um, an organism that I had problems uh, identifying whether it's gram positive or gram negative, and what happens is the, the gram stain looks like it's gram variable, I would drop a vanc, I would do a uh, streak for growth and I would drop a vancomycin disc. If it's sensitive, if it's sensitive, then it's gram positive. If it's resistant, then it's probably gram negative. Okay. But if it's sensitive, because all gram positives are sensitive 
to vancomycin. If you have a gram positive infection, you sh so if you think about it, if you have a gram positive infection, like strep or staph, for example, then you, want, you might wanna give vancomycin, okay? So use that as your example, example to help you remember that um, gram positives are sensitive to vancomycin. Another way to uh, resist antibiotics is increase production of TVPs or reduce the number of intracellular vancomycin target. So reduce the number of targets, uh, change changes to the TVP protein, penicillin binding protein uh, by developing a thicker wall. Uh, others, uh, bacitracin antibiotic is topical. Phosphomycin is used for uncomplicated UTI. Cycloserin, which is oral, is, uh, it's good against tuberculosis, second line, and usually for multiple drug resistant organisms. Neomycin is another ointment, uh, antibiotic. That's good for eye infection, dermal infection, bowel prep for surgery, bladder irrigation. Actinomycin D, it's another uh, antibiotic. Cell membrane function inhibitors, you got your lycopep lipopeptide, which binds to, um, it's good against gram-positive bacteria, and polymyxins, which disrupts cell membrane uh, of the organism, uh, has a detergent effect. Inhibitors against protein synthesis. You have your aminoglycosides and it binds to either the 30 or 50 S ribosomal subunit. And th these subunits, I'm not gonna get into the genetics or the protein synthesis, but the ribosomal subunits are involved with the messenger RNA and tra uh, transfer RNA uh, production and protein synthesis. So I'm not gonna get into the details but the 50S, I know it attaches to the macrolides. Uh, the MLS group, you got your macrolides, lyn lincosamide and streptogramin. You know, your aminoglycosides, your genomycin, tobromycin, you're, you'll learn those. And then ketolides, oxazolidinone, oxalidinone, oxalidinones, chloramphenicol, tetracycline, and glycoglycine. Inhibitors of RNA and DNA synthesis. This is also taken off that uh, review sheet. Uh, inhibitors of RNA and DNA synthesis include your fluoroquinolones, your metronidazole, and rifampin. Inhibitors of other metabolic processes are your sulfonamides, trimethoprim, and nitro nitroferantoin. And then um, antibiotics under each class. This is what you'll have to know. It's for the beta lactams, you got your penicillin, ampicillin, cephalosporins, for glycopeptides, your vancomycin, uh, lipopeptide is daptomycin, polymyxins or colistin, and polymyxin B. Your aminoglycosides, like I mentioned, are genomycin, tobromycin, nettomycin, amicacin, and streptomycin. The, usually the aminoglycosides are good against uh, pseudomonas. Then you have your MLS group, M standing for macrolides, L standing for lincosamide, and S standing for streptogramin. Ketolides, uh, telithromycin, oxazolidinones, uh, lin linozolid, and then chloramphenicol and tetracyclines. Glycoglycine is tigacycline, fluoroquinolones, which includes the ciprofloxacin. Cipro is a common uh, antibiotic to use, and norfloxacin. Metronidazole is uh, contains flagell. Flagell is a paras is good for if a patient has a parasitic infection. So flagell is used for parasites. Rifampin is a good antibiotic. Sulfonamides, trimethoprim. Usually it's trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. That's S -A -S -X -T. There's actually a disc, uh, SXT disc for. It's, you know, how you have your A disc and your P disc. There's actually an SXT disc for group A, but uh, I didn't go into that. It's not a uh, widely used test anymore, but SXT is sulfamethoxazole trimethoprim. And then you have nitroferantoin, uh, which includes macrodantin. Nitroferantoin is good for urinary tract infections. It's a good antibiotic for urinary tract infection. Antimicrobial resistant, uh, it's either intrinsic, resistance can either be intrinsic or acquired. Intrinsic resistance is from normal genetic structure or physiological state of the organism, 
or resistance can be acquired from altered cellular physiologic and structure caused by changes to usual genetic makeup. So I talked about, remember the, the, the efflux and the changing of the target. Those are examples of acquired resistance and intrinsic resistance is the normal uh, genetic structural or physiological state, just the normal state of the organism that it, that it um, naturally resists the antibiotic. So beta-lactam uh, antibiotics are um, enzymatic destruction. So it's acquired resistance, the glycopeptide, altered cell wall precursor. So that's also acquired. Uh, lipopeptide is natural. So is polymyxin, it's natural. Aminoglycoside is acquired because it's enzymatic destruction, beta-lactamase. The MLS groups are um, acquired uh, resistance altered ribosomal target, that's acquired, or the efflux, remember the efflux, enzymatic modification, and the streptogramin, which is on the, uh, the S of the MLS group, is natural resistance. The, keto, the ketolides, the oxo, oxazolidinones uh, are both natural resistance, chloramphenicol is acquired, enzymatic modification, tetracyclines is acquired, uh, glycoglycine is natural, Fluoroquinolones uh, decrease uptake, uh, another um, mechanism of resistance, so that's acquired. And metronidazole is re natural resistance. Refamptin, altered enzyme target. Sulfonamides, tr trimethoprim is also altered enzyme targets. Nitroforantoin is natural resistance. So you got your extended spectrum beta lactamase. Remember, you have your beta lactamase, but Extended spectrum beta lactamase is kind of like a, 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 the higher generation of beta lactamase producers. Then you have your methicillin resistant Staph aureus. I mentioned VRE, which is the vancomycin resistant enterococcus, and MDROs. You know about your MDROs, which is like your um, uh, Stenotrophomonas maltophilia. That's an MDRO or actinomyces. Carbapenem rules, enterobacteriaceae should be sensitive to carbapenems. So if you have an E. coli or if you have an E. cloic, you're a klebnumo, those generally are very sensitive um, organisms and should be susceptible to the carbapenems. If the bug demonstrates increased resistance, you have to perform what's called a modified Hodge test. And if positive, public health lab um, needs to be notified and it's control called an infection control emergency. So the way you do the modified Hodge test is you're, you're pretending like you're doing a, a Kirby Bauer on Mueller Hinton. You do a long streak, 0 0.5 McFarland. Remember that from um, the, the Kirby Bauer antibiotics. And then you apply your miripenem disc right in the middle. And then from the disc, the one disc alone in the middle, streak unknown and controls towards the disc, and it looks like this. There's your meropenem disc. This is your positive control, Klebnumo, has a specific ATCC, B, BAA1705. And this is your negative control, and that's what negative looks like. And it's ATCC, BAA1706. So these are known controls the Cle of Klebnumo, um, positive control and negative control. And then that's your meropenem disc. And this is your test streak right here. And because it looks like the negative control, then your test uh, isolate is negative. So you have a known positive, you have a known negative, you have a test a streak, and you compare what, what it looks like. If it looks like the positive, then it's positive. If it looks like the negative, then it's negative. Polymyxins, uh, different types of polymyxins, A through A. The most common one is polymyxin B. Uh, polymyxin E is colistin. Uh, polymyxins can be even intramuscular or IV or topical, ophthalmic or inhaled, different ways of um, administering polymyxin. Polymyxins were discovered in the 40s. Uh, the problem is it's, it's toxic to your liver. It's neurotoxic to your nerves, neuromuscular blockade. So it can cause problems it has a detergent property. It degrades the cell membrane and emerging resistance to the polymyxins. 
and that's it. Okay, so that's it for the endomicrobial mechanism of action. So make sure you be familiar with the um, antibiotic mechanism of action review. And like I said, uh, it's in outline format, but I'll try to give you a review to help break down these antibiotics to help you study for it. Because memorizing this, I mean, pre in previous classes, uh, students had trouble, but, um, but I'll, I'll put a review together for you. Are there any questions on any of these two, on any of these two lectures? No questions? Okay, good. So tomorrow we're gonna have an easy lab. I can't, we're having trouble getting strep pneuma to grow. If Daniela gets strep pneuma to grow, then we'll drop an A disc and uh, we'll take a look at growth on Friday. Um, I'm sorry, uh, not A disc, but we'll drop a P disc on the pneumo and we'll look for sensitivity. And if we, and then if we get good growth, then we'll, we'll do the biosolubility test with sodium deoxycholate. So um, tomorrow I'll do the review, no lecture. Uh, it's gonna be similar to the other reviews that I did. Um, make sure I sent you two reviews, review number one and review number two. Uh, make sure you memorize those two reviews, okay? I'm not gonna say be familiar, I'm telling you, memorize them because those are gonna be um, key components of your exam on Friday. And then I'm going to do the review for you uh, tomorrow. And I'm going to do it the same way I did last time. I'm going to do it twice. And hopefully I'll get some participation from you guys. All right. Are there any questions at this point? So on Monday, is it only homework 13 and 14 due? This coming Monday? Mm -hmm. uh, today is Wednesday. You're already looking towards Monday? Wow, that's pretty advanced. Um, yeah, uh, just those two. So are we going to lecture on mycobacteria at all this week, or is that for next week? No, mycobacteria is, we're not going to do mycobacteria. Mycobacteria okay. is the AFBs. We're not, uh, not even thinking about that yet. So I'll verify, I'll verify with you what homework is due next week and next Monday. But at this point, since I did these two lectures, it'll be homework on these two lectures. Okay. It's not fair for me to have you turn in homework that I haven't lectured on yet. So uh, homework on Monday is uh, um, related to these two lectures because your exam next Friday, a week from Friday, will be on the uh, spirochetes and uh, antimicrobial mechanism of action. Any other questions? Okay, if not, I'll see you at four o'clock tomorrow.